Okay. You got the window here. Yep. All right. So yeah. So I was um I was a member of AE for probably about three years. Um, when I was in my undergrad for uh, computer engineering at MSU, and um, the the last year, my fourth year, I was uh, uh, vice president and then president. And uh, I was kind of focused on microphone building and microphone uh, preamplifiers. And uh, I did a lot of other things, but microphones was probably one thing that I focused on a lot. So um, when you guys asked me to speak on that, I kind of just thought I'd make a um, kind of a summary slide show to uh, talk about a couple different types that are pretty common. and. Um, what the difference is between them, what some of their common applications are, and um, kind of uh, go from there with whatever questions anybody might have for me. I, hopefully I can answer uh, from what I know. So really, um, when it comes down to it, when people are talking about microphones, you've got two main types, and that comes down to the type of the diaphragm, which uh, picks up the audio and then generates a uh, a signal that you can then amplify and listen to. And those two types are dynamic microphones and condenser microphones. And there are two types, two main types of dynamic microphones. There is a ribbon microphone and the moving coil magnet. And the, so I'll talk about both of those and then I'll talk about the condenser microphone and why it's called a condenser. Um, so, Dynamic microphones, the first ones really in history were the ribbon microphone. And you see these maybe a lot in um, old photos from the you know early 20th century, 1920s, 1930s. And uh, RCA made really one of the big popular ones. And the concept behind it is a corrugated foil ribbon that's suspended between two magnet plates. And there is a, a step up transformer in the output because the signal that this generates is extremely small. So when you talk into a ribbon microphone, the sound pressure from your voice is actually vibrating this little foil. And the vibrations, because they're between a magnet, the vibrations induce a current and you get a voltage that comes out that represents that waveform. So these were really the first microphones that went into radio. Um, you had vocals. And today they're kind of used more for what people refer to as room recording. So if you're going to re record, say, uh, a band, maybe even an orchestra, you're going to mic every instrument, you're going to mic the vocalist all separately. But if you want to capture like the sound of the environment, like a stage or a studio, you might put a couple ribbon microphones outside in the edges of the rooms. And they're just, because they're the way that they're sensitive, they pick up a bit of those extra sounds and you can mix that in. So they're still used today. Um, some people kind of use them just because they're different and they're special. Um, a ribbon microphone, um, we'll talk more about what polar plots are, but if you look at the little graph on the bottom right, that is a, a pattern or representation of the pattern of how sounds interact with the ribbon. On both sides of the ribbon, it can pick up audio. So that's what's known as like a bi-directional or a figure of eight pattern. And that's pretty common with both condenser microphones and ribbon microphones. So that's a commonality that you'll see between those two. So when most people these days talk about what a dynamic microphone is, they're actually referring to a moving coil dynamic microphone. And these are really, really common. And the really popular ones shown there is like a, a Shure SM58 or a 57, which is actually the same microphone with a, a different uh, gasket on the top. But, um, these are really great for vocals. People use them for live performances. You might see somebody on a stage walking around with it. Um, they're really, really robust. And um, how they work is 
it's almost the complete opposite of how a speaker works. A speaker works by having a coil that you induce uh, current through the coil and it moves the diaphragm and sound waves come out. Well, a dynamic coil microphone works in the opposite direction. You have a coil that is um, pertubed or is uh, it's moved by sound pressure. And when that movement is translated into a mechanical movement on the coil, you get a signal on the output. So it's a really, really simple design and um, they've been around for a real long time too. Um, they're, like I said, they're popular for live performances. Uh, people use them on uh, drums, guitar ampl amplifiers, vocals, um, just really, really common. And then we have the condenser microphone. And so a condenser microphone is a whole other kind of fabrication. So back in like the 19th century, uh, when electronics were just really starting to get their their push in the scientific industry, their the terms were a lot different than what we're using today. So a capacitor is what we would call a condenser in the 19th and the 20th century. They were called condensers. And so that was the original term for a capacitor. And a condenser microphone is actually comprised of uh, one or more capacitors formed on these uh, plates. So if you look at the, the bottom right picture, you can actually see there's two plates. You can see one side of the capsule here. So there's um, like a, a film that might be made out of mica or some other uh, dielectric or insulating film. And they sputter gold on that. And so you create a really, really rudimentary capacitor that when this is vibrated and there's a voltage that's biased across it, that voltage will vary. And so that, excuse me, that difference in the voltage is seen as an audio signal. So it's similar to like the moving coil or the ribbon in that uh, a, a voice or a sound pressure wave, when it hits this diaphragm, the output is seen in a voltage that can then be amplified and turned into something that we can listen to or we can look at. So this is just different because they're using a capacitor and they're putting a bias voltage across the capacitor so that the capacitor, when it is pertubed, when those plates move closer or further apart from each other, you get a voltage that changes. So it has kind of a reference voltage. So um, you might see this in a term that's called phantom power is, is the, the modern term for it. Um, you could have anywhere between five volts, 12 volts, 48 volts, 100 volts on some specific condenser microphones. Uh, these are very sensitive pieces of equipment um, and they're kind of an instrument in themselves. So some of them can range anywhere from hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars, depending on how precise they are. But they tend to pick up the faintest of sounds. So if I was using a condenser microphone in, in the room that I'm in right now, you would probably hear cars on the street moving. I mean, it's pretty silent right now because we just had a snowstorm. But um, they'll pick up a lot of noise that if you don't have a room that's been treated acoustically, you're going to hear a lot of other things that other microphones might not pick up. So these tend to be used in uh, recording studios. Uh, you might see um, a voice actor using them for like a... Uh, a CG movie or a cartoon. Um, and people sometimes will use them for interviews. Um, a lot of people have different preferences for how a microphone might make their voice sound. So, you know, uh, when it comes to things like podcasting or video blogging, uh, YouTubers, they all might have a different preference for the kind of microphone they use based on how much money they might have to throw out a microphone or, um, you know, what kind of what kind of sound they want from their voice because they all do have a slightly different sound. Um, with condensers, though, there are other types. Uh, one of the more recent and really common type is the electric micro, uh, capsule condenser microphone. And you'll see these a lot in um, smaller circuits. Uh, you can see them on PCBs. You can see them in some... Uh, mobile devices, you might find them in a, on a Bluetooth 
uh, speaker or in um, Bluetooth headphones sometimes, and they can be really, really small. And it, it still has the capacitor forming that condenser capsule, but they put a transistor in the same body. So all you have to do to use one of these microphones is apply the bias voltage. And some of these, because they're so small, they might only need like three volts, five volts, nine volts. So you don't have to have like a mains voltage. You can run these off of a battery. So you find these on a lot of wireless devices, walkie talk, <coughs> excuse me, walkie talkies, hand radios. Um, you know, they're, they're really common. So that probably I'd say for the last 20 or 30 years has really been a mainstay for smaller mobile devices. But within the last decade or so, we started getting these MEMS devices. And these take that uh, capsule design from Electra and makes it a microscopic design. So now you're working on a level where you have this teeny little chip that you can put on any circuit board and it is a microphone. And this really came out of, you know, miniaturizing um, microelectronics from the late 90s and the 2000s when we we're trying to make everything as small as possible. And this is the kind of microphone that you'd actually find in a cell phone or a smartphone today because they're very small. Um, I don't have a picture for reference, but this little chip here is, you know, probably a little bit bigger than the nose on the president's face on the dime. It's not a very big chip at all. It's very small. And it still works with the same kind of principle that a condenser microphone uses. There's a capacitor that's formed out of a thin membrane of silicon. And this process took a long time to come up with, but it's really repeatable. And so they can make, you know, hundreds or thousands of these on a wafer, and they're really cheap now. For a long time, they were really expensive. But you can now put these in all kinds of really small applications, like a headset. So you could have this like on the boom of a headset for somebody like uh, at the Super Bowl or somebody who's, um, you know, a, a live speaker at a seminar and they're in smartphones, Bluetooth devices, some hearing aids now and tablets. Um, but because it's so small, they've also started to integrate the actual digital components in them too. So you can have a MEMS condenser that is completely analog, that has a waveform as the output that you can then put into another audio chain and amplify it. Or you can have one that's digital. There is an analog to digital converter built right in on the chip, and it hooks up directly to, say, a microcontroller or a microprocessor. So you have an analog signal in, and you have digital going out for your digital processing. So, you know, you can start using these things on Arduinos, on Raspberry Pis, or on a computer. And so with all of this, we have many different types of microphones. But, you know, what makes them unique? What makes each of them different? Why would you choose a condenser or a dynamic microphone for something that you want to record? Well, there's a lot of different things that go into the measurements of a microphone. So um, the picture up on the right shows an anechoic chamber at uh, Schur, um in Niles, Illinois, and they do testing of all their microphones so that they can get um, you know, detailed specs when they sell a microphone as to what the consumer wants and needs. So you might have a microphone that needs to have its response for you know, somebody's vocals ranging <clears throat> between, you know, 260 hertz to 8,000 hertz at the high end. But you don't need to get all of the frequencies below that or above that if this microphone's only going to be used for vocals. It's the same thing if it was like for a violin or a cello. You would choose a microphone that is going to pick up or respond accurately to those frequencies. So measurements are really important and knowing what microphone that you want to choose for an application. And this is kind of just a, a simple setup of how um, measurements are made, because if you ever look at um, a data sheet for a microphone, they're going to throw all kinds of, of specifications at you, what the frequency response is, what the, the polar pattern is, 
and you might not need to know all of that information. But if you do, you can look at it and understand the basics of, of what they're trying to tell you. So typically what a measurement like this for a frequency response would look like is you have a microphone that is set at a distance away from a speaker and the speaker is driven with a sine wave at a set frequency and they sweep that through the audio range. So it might start at um, tens of hertz or 100 hertz and go all the way up to 20,000 hertz. And as it sweeps, they take a measurement of what the amplitude or the voltage of that microphone is. And that's often represented in decibels. And that's, you know, showing <clears throat> kind of what is the loudness that this microphone's response is. So they're going to point the microphone at the speaker, but they're going to sweep the frequency. And as they sweep the frequency, you'll see variations in how the microphone responds. So uh, a microphone that's been designed for vocals might have an increase in the human vocal range between, you know, 200 hertz and 8,000 hertz or 8 kilohertz. But it might be relatively flat or it might have weird shapes outside of that range. Or you might have a microphone that's extremely flat over the entire audio range. And that kind of a microphone would be known as like a reference microphone because the response doesn't really change as the frequency changes. So uh, a reference microphone would be kind of this one on the left, if we're looking at the, the chart on the right, and one that might be good for audio for, uh, for vocals might be on the right. There's gonna be some peaks in a couple kilohertz, and it's gonna roll off after we no longer hear after 20 kilohertz. But the other thing is also a pattern. So as you rotate a microphone and you start talking into the side of it, you're slowly going to hear um, an, a, different effects of how the microphone is picking up your voice. So um, artists have tried representing this in both 2D and 3D. So there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it. Uh, so I just tried to represent kind of some common pictures of what this looks like. Um, so the really common ones are like a cardioid, the omnidirectional, the supercardioid, and the bidirectional. So like the bidirectional is going to be like a, a ribbon mic or a condenser microphone because it's like a flat body and you could talk to either side of it. So they represent that kind of with these two um, hemispheres on both sides. And that is where the microphone is most sensitive. So if you're talking kind of within that, direction of the microphone, it's going to receive your voice or an instrument uh, the best. So if you look at something like the cardioid or the super cardioid, they don't have very much of that shape on the back side of the microphone. So if you were talking at somebody who was holding a microphone, that microphone is likely not to pick up your voice nearly as much as the person who's talking into it. So if you had, you know, two people having a conversation, you would want to have a microphone for each of them. But you could also easily choose a bi-directional microphone so that one person looking at the microphone could be heard and the other person looking at the microphone could be heard. So there's definitely different choices out there for whatever application you might have. But then there's also special case microphones. Now these are still, you know, condenser microphones or uh, dynamic microphones, but there's microphones that are built for very specific tasks. Uh, one of them is the shotgun microphone. And these can range anywhere from like six inches to 20 something inches, really long boom microphones. And if you've ever watched like um, behind the scenes or if you've ever seen somebody filming a uh, production for a film or a TV show, you'll probably see somebody holding what they refer to as a boom mic. Well, it's a, it's a big, long stick, and they have a shotgun microphone on the end of it. And what these microphones do is they're very, very narrow. They tend to only pick up the sound right in the front of the capsule, and they have a very specific design, so they reject sounds coming from the sides. That way, if you had um, actors on screen um, citing their roles, you could point that microphone right at them and you would pick up their voice. 
So then when uh, the production crew is later going through and trying to add uh, voiceover that was maybe recorded in a studio session with what was actually filmed, they could line up the audio so that it matches the person's mouth moving with the audio that they actually said while they were being filmed. Um, you can also pick up kind of how the sound environment on a stage or in a filming site was when you film it if you use a microphone like this. So there's a lot of different techniques that I'm not going to go into because that's really not my focus. But um, there are other types of microphones out there. And a shotgun is, is really common if you, if you know very much about uh, film production. Um, another one is uh, lavalier microphones and headset mics. These are used a lot for interviews, um, commercials, um, some live performance and seminars. Uh, usually you'll see it like buttoned uh, on somebody's shirt or it might be taped on the back of their shirt. There's a lot of different ways that these microphones are uh, set up. But these tend to be those MEMS circuits. They're very small. So they're really taking advantage of semiconductor technology here to make a microphone that blends in and looks like it's just an article of your clothing. And within the recent couple of years, there've been some very interesting advances. Um, there is a technology from, uh, from the RF world, pretty much from antennas and radar called beamforming. And well, audio engineers decided to kind of steal this idea and they've made smart microphone systems that have an array of highly directional microphones and they can turn them on and off in order to basically steer the microphone in, an, in like a, an office, um, like a boardroom meeting. You could steer it to the person who's speaking because it can detect the person who's speaking the loudest and make all of the other microphones quiet. So you might have something like this in the ceiling in the center of a boardroom and it will determine who the speaker is at that time and make all of the other microphones pointing at the other people quieter. So the person speaking is the person that's hurt. So this has really kind of come out in the last couple of years. Um, I know there's a, a couple companies working on them and there's, um, there's a lot of advances there. It's really kind of neat stuff. Um, I guess I'd say that's kind of was science fiction just a couple of years ago. But um, it's, it's neat. So that's kind of the basics of the microphones. But how, how do we hear it? What's the next step? Well, there's a lot of different ways that you can make a microphone audible after we speak into it. This can range anywhere from preamplifiers and effects uh, that is in hardware, or you might even have just a simple microphone interface and you have software with uh, VST plugins on your computer. Um, that's really popular these days too. So you might have hardware that takes up desk space or rack space in order to increase this really tiny signal and um, you know, add different effects like compression or equalizing to it. Or you might have one preamplifier and uh, the software on your computer doing all of the rest. Uh, so kind of with that, I mean, the, the most modern thing that people think of when they think of microphones is, well, I, I like podcasts or I like watching YouTube. So how, how do I know what kind of microphone they're using and, and what is, you know, the current popular microphone? Well, there's been a lot of, excuse me, there's been a lot of microphones introduced in the last couple of years, especially within, um, 2019 to 2020. Um, there's a lot that are common that are just USB microphones. And these kind of microphones might have a preamplifier built in. They might have um, effects built in. Uh, some of them are just straight USB. And you do all of the processing on the computer. And some of them have like an XLR output or a microphone output. And you're doing hardware processing or an amplifier like uh like a uh, audio interface, and then you can do stuff on the computer side. Um, this is really kind of where the microphone industry is pushed recently because there's a lot of sales there. And so even Sure took one of their really popular microphones and gave it a spin, and they put a preamplifier in it. 
and um the mb7 just came out a couple months ago and it's become a very popular microphone so you know it, it really depends on what the person is trying to do um are they are they vocals are they talking are they playing an instrument uh are we recording a guitar amplifier or drums and you know what is the the desired sound after you're recording and that really kind of determines what kind of a microphone you might use. So there's all kinds. There's too many to list, really. But if you kind of narrow it down to a dynamic microphone or a condenser microphone, you can kind of weed out what direction that you want to go in. And there's really a lot out there. There's some really cool products these days. Um, there's, there's a lot of different things you can look at. And if you at least know somewhere to start, then hopefully you can find what you're looking for um it's kind of a side passion for me just because i really like how the technology has advanced um when i was in aee i built a, a vacuum tube condenser microphone um i know that dr worsley used that to do some of his recordings he really liked how it sounded now uh, i've got one of those myself and um i'm actually using a, a dynamic microphone right now so there's a lot of different things out there and you know, hopefully it was uh, kind of informative just to tell you a little bit about some of the common microphones. And um, yeah, I, I kind of want to just know, do you guys have any questions? Hopefully I can can help you find an answer. Yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a question. So, um, based, so when you were talking about the uh, moving coil, like you showed us the moving coil diagram mm -hmm. or, or a diaphragm for the, uh, for the dynamic microphone. Sure. So is is this acting as like a is like an inductor? So I the coil would be the inductor. Um you have a magnet and um the coil is wrapped around the center part of like the iron core on a magnet. And right. so the the diaphragm is the part that's moving and that movement of it moving the coil around the center post on the magnet is actually what's inducing the current through the coil. So that okay. so it's, it's a physical movement. And same with the same with the capacitor, like the the plates are moving slightly. Yep. The so plates I, are moving like closer and farther apart from each other, and right. that distance change will change the voltage on the capacitor. Okay. So I mean so, you're you're kind of modifying the capacitance of that capacitor at the time. Right. Um so I guess I'm just I, I don't I'm not I'm trying to think of like the right question to ask about like um I guess thinking of it from like a signal point of view. Mm -hmm. Um if you have the same uh you put a you put a dynamic and a condenser next to each other, you have the you have like the capacitor design and the inductor, like the coil design. If you were to send the same, like you, let's say you're doing that uh, signal sweep, like you were talking about earlier. Yep. Like, um, I guess from a physical point of view and like a like a signal response point of view, what are the main differences in, I guess, sound that we would get from the different movements of the capacitor and the inductor? Like, what that because that's probably the main difference in sound that we're getting from right is those two different yeah yeah sounds. your frequency response does does uh change how you how you perceive um the same signal that's going into a microphone um i i probably could have found a couple um frequency responses but um so like a dynamic uh, like a, a moving coil microphone they tend to have a roll off on their lower frequencies so you might not be picking up the sound as as um you might not have a very good signal at something that's less than say 50 hertz whereas a condenser just because of the the nature of how delicate it is you may be picking up things far down in single hertz uh, there are some uh, condenser microphones that are used for um, sub audio uh, frequencies. So we're talking like 0.1 hertz to like 2 hertz. And those are kind of, you know, things like whales talking um, and 
you, you might hear wind movements and things, a lot of nature. Kind of recording a, a microphone with a, a condenser capsule will be used for that. Just because you were talking about a really thin film that can be easily pushed by a vibration, whereas a moving coil has, essentially the coil kind of acts as a spring. So there's going to be some, um, some firmness to that spring. And you have to overcome, you know, what that spring constant of the coil is before you start inducing a current through it. So, okay. yeah, they are going to sound different. Um, and, and that's, that is, there's a lot of physics that go into it. Um, I, I watched a, a, a presentation from Sure once where they were talking about how just changing the shape of the body of a microphone or the material that the microphone body was made out of drastically changed the frequency response of the microphone, which kind of went over my head there because I'm an electrical engineer. I'm not, you know, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I'm not looking at how, you know, changing a shape <laughs> changes the resonance of a microphone. But yeah, there's a lot that go into it. And there's definitely a big difference between, say, a condenser and a dynamic microphone. Uh, would you say that's probably the main reason you said, like, kind of overcoming that, like, you know, theoretical, like, um, spring constant, if you want to think of it that way, like, mm -hmm. would that be the main reason why those are on stage is so that, because there's obviously, like, a lot of, a lot of sound from the band in the background and people, you know, shouting and stuff, like. I'd, I'd say that's probably a part of it. Um, the other is, I didn't really discuss, but there is, um, there's what's a term called SPL or sound pressure level. Um, dynamic microphones in nature tend to have a higher level of um, sound pressure level that they are capable of handling. So you wouldn't want to put a condenser microphone in front of a kick drum. You definitely wouldn't want to put a, a ribbon microphone in front of a kick drum. Just that sound pressure at that low frequency and the intensity could actually damage certain microphones. So you would want to put a microphone that can withstand a high sound pressure level or a high decibel and a high amount of air volume moving at it and back and forth and back and forth. So you would choose something like a, a dynamic microphone because it's it, the way that it's designed is it's a lot more um, robust for uh, loud sounds. So like a dynamic microphone would be commonly found on a stage because you might have somebody reaching up and grabbing the microphone and shouting into it, or you might have it in front of a kick drum, or you might have it pointed at, um, you know, at a, at an amplifier that suddenly your guitarist hit a riff and it just went like 20 decibels louder than everything else. So you have to have a microphone that's also going to withstand the abuse, um, just the, the actual mechanical abuse of sound waves hitting it um i i'd say that's probably why you find dynamic microphones on like uh like a live stage most most of the time you'll find a condenser on something like you might microphone a violin or a piano a, you know a grand piano something that the sound is delicate and it's really crisp and so you want to catch all of the really quiet, subtle parts of that instrument, but the instrument's not going to be clashing and banging. So you don't have to worry about damaging the microphone. Gotcha. I have one, I have one more question too. Um, sure. About the, about the condensers. Um, I know that I, I've had to use like the 48 volt phantom power before and mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I don't know if I don't know if you mentioned I, uh, if if you mentioned it, but like, what's the main purpose for that extra forty eight volts for the condensers? Like, why is that sure. why is that needed? So I think probably this little diagram on um, on the electric would help. So um, so especially with an electric, you have uh, a FET, a field effect transistor that could be uh, you know a MOSFET or a JFET, and in order for um, for these um semiconductor transistors to work they have to have a bias voltage and that's essentially you know your your turn on voltage of your transistor in order to get it into the um the operating range that you want to amplify the sound 
So a condenser may have a transistor in it, or in the older condenser microphones, you might have a vacuum tube in there. So the 48 volts is essentially acting as a battery to turn on the um, transistors inside of that microphone in order to um, in order to make it amplify. Because how a basic transistor circuit is going to work is you bias it with a DC voltage, and that DC voltage allows it to make these swings in the positive or negative direction when you put a small signal on the input and get a large signal on the output. So 48 volts, I don't, I don't know exactly where 48 volts came from, but that became kind of the standard and that's, that's what you see now. Um, but it's a large enough um, voltage that you can put a pretty big potential on several transistors. Uh, some condensers might have a, an entire chain of transistors in there to make the amplifier. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, but like the Electra is really the basic uh, version because there's just a single transistor in there and you're just applying a couple volts of DC to it in order to uh, get the output. But that that's pretty much what the, the phantom power is there for. It's there to turn on the electronics that are doing the amplification for you. Just because like a condenser microphone, um, the signal that is coming out of that capacitor is so small. You have to amplify it right away. Because if you don't amplify it right at the source, all of the all of the parasitic values of your uh, cables coming out of the microphone are going to make that signal so small and noisy when you amplify it at like a mixer or an audio interface. So you need to bring that voltage of that signal up at least closer to a line level than a mic level right at the start. So phantom power is typically used for that. Gotcha. Okay, makes a lot more sense. And then, so uh, I, I noticed that like like the, the SM57s, they don't they don't require phantom power. So nope. um, I'm assuming there's no. Uh, so like, where would that? I guess I guess as a comparison, where would the uh, just the mic signal compare uh, for a dynamic and a condenser? Where would that fall in line, like DB wise? Yeah. So a dynamic usually has a pretty large, um, a pretty large signal output. Um, let's see. Actually, I think I can probably just look up a data sheet real quick. And if the other, if if, if anyone else here has questions, feel free to ask. I, I don't want to. I don't want to like. Yeah, no, feel free to ask any questions you guys might have. I'll answer the best of my knowledge. You pretty much answered all the questions I've had. <laughs> okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, let's see if I can find their spec sheet here. Spec sheet. Glad we did that frequency uh, uh, discussion last week because there was some stuff in there that I hope I hope you guys understood from last week that that was in this uh, was in this discussion Cam gave us. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry I pulled I showed up late. Did you guys just finish the uh, the the presentation? Well, I I have it recording right now, so he's at. Um, I'll, I'll put it in the. I'll either I'll put it on the Discord somehow um, for people that missed the uh, for people that missed this, so they can go back and watch stuff. Or... Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share the uh, the like data sheet that uh, Sure has for their SM product, and this this is their line of various different microphones. Um, so maybe we can. This is the SM7B, which I was mentioning earlier is. This was um, really like the high end, very popular for um, interviews, podcasts, that kind of thing. But it's out of the price range for a lot of people who are just getting into it. So they introduced the um, the S uh, 
gosh, what is it? The the S the MV7, which is essentially a USB version that doesn't require uh, preamplification on the output. Um, we should have uh, open circuit voltage. Okay, so they have in their spec sheet they have an output level, and this is essentially their open circuit voltage or um, what it is at 1,000 hertz is 1.12 millivolts, which is pretty small. So you would want to amplify this as soon as possible. Whereas if we look for, and this is their frequency response, we're gonna try and find the uh, 57 or the 58. So here's the 57. They have 1.6 millivolts uh, open circuit and their SPL is 94. So that's essentially saying that a high SPL at 94 decibels, um, you can have a pretty large, a really loud sound going into this microphone. Whereas the SM7B, it has, did it list it? Uh, they might not actually list what the SPL is for this one. Interesting. And most of theirs, they do actually list it. Um, so yeah, so this was their frequency response for the 57. So it, kind of like it, I was talking about, right above two kilohertz and ending at eight, you've got a bit of a peak. A, a lot of people tend to, um, speech patterns is like right between four and six kilohertz. So they have a peak there where it's louder and it's quieter on the low end, like below 200 hertz and above 10 kilohertz, it starts getting quieter. Is this, is this response after amplification? No, this is before amplification. So the way that they take the measurement is they take a reference microphone, and, which oh, is gonna okay. be extremely flat, and they take a measurement of that speaker and the preamplifier afterwards, and then they take the measurement of the microphone that's under test, and they basically subtract the two lines. So if you were to look at this after amplification, you might shift the whole thing up, say 60 dB, um, so that it was something you could analyze easily. But then you would subtract all of that down and it would lower itself so it's back flat at zero dB. So this is essentially, what it would look like without amplification. There was amplification done in the process, but it's all been subtracted out of the pattern that you actually see here. Sure, okay. So like this one here, the 48 is kind of flat at, you know, the 200s up to one kilohertz, and then it starts climbing and they got a peak at uh, about six and a half kilohertz. So there's, you know, a lot of different patterns a lot of different frequency responses for them. Um, this is the 58. The 58 and the 57 are very similar. So they have the same um, capsule, but they have a different grill. And this is kind of where I was talking about how if they modify a certain mechanical part of the microphone, it actually changes the frequency response. So if you look at the two, the grill is different. The 57, the grill is kind of designed to be taking audio directly from the front, not very much from the sides. Whereas the 58, you could kind of turn that thing 30 to 45 degrees in all axes and you probably still get a pretty good signal. So it's really, really wide. But if you look at the frequency response, you can see that it's kind of flat here at the vocals. So it, it hits between uh, four kilohertz and six kilohertz, there's almost no change. Whereas the previous one, the 57, it's squished. You've got more response between five kilohertz and seven kilohertz. So they like squished it and moved it up in frequency a little bit. And the only change on there is actually the grill between the two microphones. So there's yeah. a lot going on here other than just the difference between the dynamic and uh, a uh, condenser microphone. Each family itself, there's a lot of things that go into how a microphone sounds. So you might have um, somebody who prefers a 57 over a 58. Well, they 
are the same microphone. They just have a different grill, but they do sound different. So, I mean, you might want to use one over the other for like a guitar amplifier or for vocals. A lot of people use a 58 for vocals and will use the 57 for amplifying a cabinet or amplifying a drum set just because it's more directional. And the sound, it does sound different. I mean, to the untrained ear, you might not know any difference, but to the people who are doing this stuff day in and day out, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna be able to tell the difference. But you know, that's their job. To you know, a normal Joe on the street, now there are two microphones. What does it matter, right? I'm gonna talk in it and you're gonna hear me. But um, yeah, so, you know, I, yeah, go ahead. I had a question about, um, you know, a lot of mics will have like um, low end or high or high passes. Yeah, um, this is actually one. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, yeah. The, that, is that basically just, is that just changing the frequency response? Is that all it's doing? That's exactly what it's doing. Okay. So like this one has um, a selection for a flat, a uh, looks like a low pass. I think this is a mirror. Yeah, it's a mirrored image. And then they have a really, really sharp one. So on their frequency response chart, they actually have what each of those selector switches do. That's cool. So this was actually the perfect one for your question. Because, yeah, you could select it. I think this is probably a phantom powered one, which would be why they have. Um, why they have the option to change that. Let's see if it's phantom powered. Um, uh, don't see any. Oh, yep, yep. Um, polarity protection. So this one is protected up to 52 volts. Oh, I can't tell whether or not it actually needs phantom. I, I've actually never seen an 81 myself. Yes, phantom powering. Uh, from 12 to 48. So some really old mixing consoles did use 12 volts. Um, and you can still find some today that have an option to switch between like 12 and 48. So this microphone has an active circuit in there. Um, so like how, how many of you guys have taken um, to, uh, 202 yet? EC 202. Yeah, okay, so you've seen uh active high pass low pass filters band band pass or um any of those filters where you put the signal in and then you can kind of tweak that to change where the frequency stops coming out um i don't think i've, I've gotten there yet in that class at least okay i, I think it was 202 that had it's been a while <laughs> it's it's been a while but um basically there is you know a um there's going to be a transistor in there and there's a circuit um, that's built around that transistor that when you switch that knob, you're changing the frequency response. So you're making a filter that is either a flat response, like the top one, or they have a roll off at about uh, 500 hertz. And then another one that you can turn on where the roll off is at about 100, looks like 120 hertz. So yeah, there's a little active circuit in there. So this one has phantom power in order to make that circuit work. So if we take away whether or not this needs amplification right away, this one has an active circuit at the very minimum in order to do the filter. So you might have a dynamic microphone even that has a selectable frequency switch. And so that might be phantom powered just for that. While the dynamic part of it itself might not need um a fat in there to amplify it right away there may be an active circuit in there that's modifying the frequency so phantom power can be used for a couple different things is there a way to have a have a microphone that doesn't use phantom power that still has a, a filter like that uh yeah it would be a, pa a passive uh network so you might have um like an rlc network so you've got a um you might have uh a combination of resistors and inductors or inductors and capacitors or capacitors and resistors forming um, that network. And so you could flip a switch to turn it on or flip a switch to disconnect it. So you could also do that. Um, 
I'm, I'm not familiar with the with the SM81, so I couldn't tell you what's in it. But my guess is they're probably using an active circuit just because they have the phantom power there. They might as well use it. Getting into some more weird responses. This one, I, 87A. So this is what's known as a supercardioid. So you can actually pick up. Um, so zero degrees is at the front of the microphone and 180 is at the back end of the microphone. So you can actually pick up some things on the back of the microphone. In some cases it's desirable, some cases it's not desirable at all. So um, they have... Like oh, I'm sorry, what'd you say? I was just wondering like when that would be needed. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I. I actually am not sure why, when you might want that, um, but you might want the other, I would say it's probably undesirable to have a back lobe in your pattern, but the front lobe, the, the bigger portion of that pattern is probably what you're looking for. And that back lobe might be um, simply a product of the design of the microphone itself. They might not have been able to get away with it, but you might want, the main portion of that pattern might be really desirable for you. So you may like the microphone, but it might have that caveat of there's a small back lobe that can pick up sound from the back. Um, on this one, we're looking at zero dB, which is like the max output. Um, this solid line, um, we have five, negative five, negative 10, negative 15 and 20. So that back lobe is sitting somewhere between negative 15 and negative 10. So that is significantly less than zero dB. I mean, we're looking at maybe negative 12 dB at that back lobe, but you're still gonna hear it. So the kind of sound that you would be picking up might be somebody holding the microphone. If they toss it from one hand to the next, you're gonna hear that um, the body of the mic actually being picked up. So that wouldn't be desirable, but yeah, it's, I, I don't know that there's a, um, a time when you would want to hear that back lobe, but it is going to be present in certain designs, especially this one, which is known as a super, a super cardioid. The SM58 and 57 are just a normal cardioid, and they tend not to have that back lobe. See, it's absent here. Uh, at some frequencies, it is present. Like at two kilohertz, there is a back lobe that's present, but it's still negative 10 dB versus what's in the front, which is zero dB. So this is kind of why measurement is important when you're gonna choose one, because you wanna know and what kind of application is the microphone gonna be best for. This one has almost nothing as far as the back lobe. Almost all of it is in the front. So, so to get those polar plots, do they just, um, ha have you been able to like, um, have you ever been to do, or have you ever been able to do measurements on your own, like in an anechoic chamber where? You can. Um, so uh, what, it, what it involves is the same setup as the frequency response, uh, except you're gonna have the microphone on a turntable. And so that microphone now is going to rotate at different uh, fractions of angles. It could be even one degree or five degrees. And you're gonna rotate it at that frequency until you get what's called a polar plot or a polar pattern. So this one here on the left was, the solid line was done at 100 Hertz. So they pointed the speaker and the microphone directly at each other. 100 Hertz measured what the decibel output was. Then they rotated it and they did it again and they rotated it and they did it again. And eventually you end up with a really large table that has what the output of the microphone is in decibels and what the angle was. And then you can make a polar plot. Um, you can do it in like MATLAB or um, Python. And basically you get this slice of a 3D representation of what the 
pickup pattern or what the sensitivity pattern of that microphone is. But yeah, you can then vary the frequency like they did here. So they did 100 hertz, 500, 1000, uh, 3150. And for some reason, they even went all the way up to uh, 610,000 hertz. So uh, 6.1 megahertz. Why they did it at that frequency, I couldn't tell you. But um, they did it to show you what it's capable of picking up at that frequency. And yeah, there are some microphones that are subsonic and, and some that are supersonic so that you might be um, picking up frequencies the human ear can't hear. Um, they tend to be called transducers at that point rather than a microphone. But um, you're still working with like infrasound or ultrasound. So um, you might have heard the term like an ultrasonic transducer. That would be picking up frequencies that are um, above the audible range and infrasound would be below the human hearing range. So in the range of Hertz, um, there are some pretty interesting studies about the, um, the actual vibration of the Earth's rotation that can be seen and it, it's a sub Hertz frequency. That was studied, I think, in the 60s. So there are a lot of different microphones that they even exist for things we can't hear, which is pretty fascinating. Basically antennas. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at it in a very rudimentary form, a microphone is kind of like an antenna. Uh, a lot of the theory can be intermixed. Um, an antenna is going to have a polar pattern. A microphone has a polar pattern. Um, an antenna is going to have a frequency response. A microphone is going to have a frequency response. Just we're looking at um, frequencies that are so low that we have, you know, we're dealing with mechanical waves, sound pressures. We're not working with electromagnetic waves. So that's really is the main difference. Um, with ultrasound, we're still working with mechanical waves. Um, that's, you know, is still a lower frequency than like a very low frequency. So we're not really working with an antenna, but a lot of the behavior, uh, as far as how you interpret the data is very similar. You would look at an antenna pattern and determine how you should point an antenna in order to get its best gain. Well, a microphone is the same way. You're going to look for where that microphone has the strongest gain and you're going to point the microphone at your sound source in order to get the loudest sound as your output. So there are some similarities that can be drawn. And um, as long as you understand the differences between the mechanical waves and the electromagnetic waves, as long as you don't get those two confused, then you're, you're good. <laughs> Great. Yeah, anyone that's interested in, uh, that's looking at 400 levels to take, if, if you're, anyone that's listening to this, if you're, uh, like if you're interested in antennas, you're already one step ahead of the game by looking at by simply just looking at this polar plot here, because they they yep. they do a lot of these measurements in that antenna class, uh, for, specifically ECU 405. Um, you you take a lot of these measurements and you know the the st the designs that you make it's actually measured by the by the TA in a in a chamber like uh, like Cameron was talking about. So yep, it's the exact same kind of process. Um... Just an anechoic chamber for RF is the materials are different and um, the shape of the uh, foam and the material of the foam is different because it's tuned for, uh, for you know, microwave frequencies or uh, very high frequencies. So you might have the foam, um, the triangles are cut specifically for megahertz and gigahertz, whereas in an in acoustic anechoic chamber, they're going to be really large shapes because the frequencies are really small. The smaller the frequency, the larger the wavelength. So with audio, you're going to be dealing with shapes that you can see. And when you're dealing with RF, the shapes are often really small just because of the size of the wave. So yeah, I, if, if you that's cool. Are in in uh, electrical engineering, and you haven't really decided what path you're going to go. I would strongly recommend looking at um, the 400 levels that are RF. Uh, 405 is great. Um, I mean, I could sell you on it because that's 
what got me into my master's program, but um, I'm not going to because that's my that's what my degree is focused on is is RF. But it's um, it's definitely a great thing to look at and and uh, investigate. And microphones and speakers, they have a lot of similarities to the things at RF frequencies. So it's 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 very interesting because you're looking at how waves behave rather than just the electrical components but you need both in order to make things work we wouldn't be having this conversation on zoom right now if we didn't have a way to pick my voice up amplify it digitize it send it across the internet decode it put it into an analog form amplify it put it through your speakers or through your headphone without the circuitry to do it so you know, there's a lot of really great things, and you just, if you're interested in uh, in electrical engineering or computer engineering, you just pick one of those portions and you focus on it, whatever you really like. And that's that's what I did with AEE because it, it gave me something that I like to do in my hobbies, but it forced me to kind of pick uh, a focus, and I ended up going with RF, and I really like it. So you know. Hopefully, um, as you're going through undergrad, you can kind of figure out what you really like to do, and it'll uh, take you great places. There's a question in the chat. Um, what does RF mean? RF stands for radio frequency. Radio frequency. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's RF is just kind of our short term. Um, there's a lot more. I mean, microwave is probably one that you've heard a lot, especially if you have one in your kitchen. <laughs> right. <laughs> But yeah, um, most people would never think twice about the microphone that's in any of their devices they use. If you've got a newer car and you've got a Bluetooth microphone somewhere in your car, it's probably a MEMS microphone nowadays. Um, if you've got a walkie-talkie in your closet or your drawer, there's probably a, a condenser um, electric microphone in it. If it's really new, it, it might be lucky, it might be MEMS, but your cell phone most definitely has a MEMS microphone in it. Um, if you've ever been up on stage, whether for high school graduation or, you know, a seminar, you know, you've held or you've talked into or seen somebody use either a condenser microphone or a dynamic microphone. And, um, you know, most people have no idea what these things are or have any interest in them, but if you like, music you like audio you probably have you know looked into it and been curious so hopefully this has kind of answered some of those questions if not piqued uh, your curiosity about it there's definitely a lot to learn about there's a really interesting area yeah i i want to thank you for this uh for giving this uh this talk i i, I definitely learned a lot about this and um, I found it really informative. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. I, <laughs> my part in AE, I always loved when we had guest speakers, um, especially those that had graduated and uh, found their career and then come back because you can kind of share a little bit of how AE helped you when you were a student. And um, I think it's an absolutely great group. And anytime that I get a chance to come back and and see the new students, see new faces, and uh, um, share a little bit of my knowledge. I love it. So hopefully the rest of you, when you graduate and you leave, you get a chance to come back too, because it's really a really great group. Uh, Cameron, if you don't mind me asking, I, I heard that you're a master or a graduate student. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. What are, what are your like um, post-academic uh, aspirations, I guess, then? Sure. So actually, um, I am starting a job with uh, UL, which is Underwriters Laboratory, and they're based out of Illinois. They're just uh, north of Chicago. And um, I'm taking on an engineering role there after I finish my, uh, my presentation for defense of my uh, master's thesis. And so I'll be starting there in March. And I'm going to be uh, an engineer for their uh, security electronics division. So that's everything from 
uh, building access entry electronics to uh, 